Hello, everyone. Welcome to our mini symposium. I'm, uh, I'm really happy to, uh, to have you all here. The lobby is constantly uh, flowing with people, so um, at the moment there's a lot of people uh, longing in. Uh, we're on the boardroom and PEM team, so we also have our company here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to have you all here, so that's, that's great. Uh, I've invited uh, our CEO, John Groten, to also kick off the session, and uh, we, will, uh, yeah, we will answer your questions uh, in between. But John, please say hi to everyone. It's most of our customer base are there online. So thank you, Eddie, for organizing this. Very welcome here to be here. Thank you, everybody, online. I think we have several countries online now. I think we have Germany, we have France, we have Greece, we have Scandinavia, several countries. Good one is UK. UK. And France. so we are probably speaking English well, so don't be afraid. We'll do it in English. Thank you. Know, we can. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, it's, it's really my pleasure and an honor to it to talk here yeah, because we, Professor or Dr. Robert McConnell we met each other years ago. And you know, the peculiar thing is Rob is a psychiatrist, a fellow that model was almost overseeing nervous sciences. And now he's overseeing and nervous sciences and psychiatry in both departments in the University of Toledo. And what makes the, uh, the collaboration so unique, in my view, or also very successful, that's I think two, three things I would mention here. And that's maybe for all of us working in the world, it's very important. First thing is, the research you do is translational. People first pick up the in the clinic and say biomarker fibers to the clinical setting. And vice versa, both sides of the department. And that's what you see a lot nowadays combining clinical and clinical research. Translation is very early. That's very nice. The second thing is to combine it with several other analytic technologies. You integrate your gene expression data, limitation gene expression data analysis. With other protein networks and also with cannabis data. And yes, the cannabis data are very interesting, but you have to look at it in an integrated fashion with other technologies as well. Very important. And I think the last and very maybe the most important fund, what I've known, uh, I have learned to know, know you in the last years, is that you integrated with your data analysis core. You have built your own data analysis by informatics technology. You keep it up. Dated and we have new thoughts about this, and it makes it very interesting for us as a company to listen and learn very carefully from you as our applies and users. But also, it makes life for you much easier to use this in a consistent and very processed manner, always using the same type of consistent data analysis for all the data you are using. That makes it so important, and that is also your success here. So it's really my pleasure to introduce you, Rob. The floor is yours. And please use this time for all the people here in the room and all of all our people here online. It's up to you. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, everyone. Uh, hi, everybody at home, on the camera to my left and in the room. It's an honor and a privilege to come back uh, to Den Bosch. Um, the last time I was here was before the pandemic. I didn't have a beard. <laughs> I had uh, fewer jobs, um, but we've never slowed down collaborating with the uh, Pamgene International Corporation and uh, we're really excited today to share uh, our work. I activated on the clicker. So I'll turn off the yeah. lights so we can there we go. see the slides. Nice pleasure. Uh, I'm a, a chief scientific officer for a psychotherapy company that has nothing to do with the presentation today. Um, this is an overview of what we're going to do. We have a couple of uh, uh, speakers here with us uh, in the room and a, and a couple that will be speaking remotely uh, from Toledo, Ohio in the United States. And this is sort of an overview. I'm going to give some opening comments. I'll probably talk for more than five minutes, um, but that's OK. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Amami Ali is going to talk about uh, getting Chinese assignments from peptides. Then Abdul uh, Hamoud, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Toledo, is going to talk about our dark kinome project, and I don't want to steal any of this thunder, but he's got some really exciting unpublished data to show. Then we have Sean Hanna. He's a junior trainee at the University of Toledo. He's been in our lab for three years, but he's an undergraduate at the university, and he's going to talk for just a few minutes about his preliminary data using an experimental phosphatase chip generated here by PMG, and that data is very exciting. Hunter Eby, who's also uh, at the University of Toledo, he's an MD PhD candidate. Hunter's going to talk about the beginnings of our sort of our own biomarker 
uh, assay project where we're trying to figure out if we can predict who's going to reject a transplanted kidney. A hunter's going to share that sort of paradigm and how much progress we've made with that. Billy Ryan will be the last trainee to talk. He's also a PhD candidate at the University of Toledo. Billy is cut from the same cloth as Hunter and Ali. They're all bioinformatics PhD candidates at the University of Toledo in our program there. And Billy's going to talk about integrating RNA-seq data with kinomeray data sets. He's got a really nice integration platform that's just about ready for prime time and to be rolled out. And then finally, if there's time, which there may not be if we have a ton of questions, I'm going to talk a little bit about our Alzheimer's uh, dementia data sets and a couple of bonus slides that are stuck in there that, that people brought up interesting questions during this visit that we'll try to cover. I don't know if I'm connected. There we go. So who are we? We're at the University of Toledo, Ohio, not Toledo, Spain, which I'm here is a lovely place, but I've never been there. Um, we call our core facility the University of Toledo Advanced Omics Core, or UTOC. That's our new logo. We just made that up, but we're very happy with it so far. Um, Dr. O'Donovan helps me run this, and we have a bunch of people that contribute to this core facility. And it's not just kinomics, but we also help people process and analyze RNA-seq data, single-cell data, proteomics data sets, and we help people integrate their data sets, which is really an area of our expertise. Um, this is just an example of what we do. We outsource the running of the RNA-seq and the proteomics to local core facilities that are very advanced and have the latest machines and technology. And really where we come in is when you get that giant data dump and that poor laboratory scientist at Toledo or somewhere else doesn't know what to do with the data, we help them very efficiently uh, figure out what to do. So a little bit now by way of a scientific introduction, why is studying biological regulation difficult? And, you know, basically it's summarized over here in this pyramid on the, the top uh, part of the screen. For example, in my field, a lot is known about the DNA. For example, in schizophrenia, which is a mental disorder, we have hundreds of thousands of patients who are sequenced. We know what a lot of the risk alleles are at the single nucleotide polymorphism level. That's a race that's over, right? How much can we learn from that? The amount of information is limited. The next level would be RNA or the uh, transcriptional level or the transcriptome. There are thousands of patients with schizophrenia who've had different parts of their brains um, sequenced for RNA, and we know a lot about the transcripts. The problem here is only about 40% of the time if you know how much mRNA is present in, say, disease versus controls, does it predict protein? You're better off flipping a coin, all right? So that's a real limitation to the traditional approaches in our field that are omics-based. Finally, if you think about phosphorylation, there's a couple of nice studies using cancer substrates showing that phosphorylation does not correlate with how much or how little protein kinase is actually in the sample. So here we have at the tip of the pyramid, that's the least well studied, protein function or functional proteomics. And of course, under that umbrella is kinomics, the stuff that you guys do here so well, the stuff that Pam G has developed this wonderful platform for and that we've really been working in collaboration with for many years. So we think that protein function measures are more informative, not that these are not useful things, but if you really wanna know what's going on, you gotta get away from having too much or too little of the gene present and think about its function. Again, there's lots of ways to modify a protein. This is just sort of my favorite way of talking about that. Phosphorylation is a big part of that. In my labs, over the years, we've studied many of these post-translational modifications that you see in biological processes, but a lot of proteins, a large percentage of the proteome is phosphorylated, 25, 30% in some estimates. That's a lot of regulation of a lot of proteins. Another thing we've done recently is sort of take a historical look at thinking about phosphorylation and activity. And this is a paper we published uh, with Dr. Alganam and, and, and uh, Abdul Hamoud a number of years ago in a very nice timeline that was generated by one of our undergraduates. And this just highlights the progress that's been made since 1953. And I think I have you guys benchmarked at 2009, but someone told me the other day that should be 2008. Maybe we can print a correction and get more press for the company. Um, <laughs> But this is an interesting 50 years that's happened since phosphorylation was first considered as a part of biological regulation. Another way to think about this field, this is a, a figure from that same paper. 
And here we've got the mention of kinase cascades and a cascade, a signaling cascade is where you think about kinase A, phosphorylates kinase B, then kinase C. That's very linear. However, that's not how signaling actually works. They're in networks. They're interacting and in, in, in being compartmentalized and moved around. And you really need a modeling network for uh, of networks, not of a linearity. So the, the verbiage matters. If you look at the um, Google Books Ingram in English, a lot of mentions of kinase cascades till about the year 2000. And then this is a steep drop off and the word kinome is becoming more in use. So some building blocks. Again, many of you in the room are listening at home, maybe very familiar with this, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, we think about the kinome as all of the protein kinases found in the human genome. It's about 530, 535. If you include all the other kinases, like lipid kinases, it gets up around 700. Subkinomes refer to those, for example, serine threonine kinases would be a subkinome, tyrosine kinases could be a subkinome, lipid kinases could be a subkinome. The active kinome, we define that as the kinase activity associated with a specific sample. All of the activity in that sample would be the active kinome of that sample. A profile would be something generated on a PAM chip, for example, or another uh, type of technology. The network would be the network generated from that active kinome found in that sample. And a couple of bioinformatics jargony words, a fingerprint or a signature, other things we think about in bioinformatics in terms of talking about data sets. How can you measure the active kinome? Well, there's a few platforms here that are out there that are commercially available, Kinome Scam, Kino Beads, and the Kinome Array, of course, here at PamGene. I'll tell you though, the only one of these platforms that measures protein kinase activity directly is the Kinome Array. That's one of the reasons we like it. These other platforms, they have utility, they're useful for screening inhibitors, but you need a lot more a priori information for these two platforms. These are more hypothesis driven, and this is more discovery uh, appropriate. This also can be hypothesis driven, but I think there's more flexibility here. The other thing I'll say in terms of ease of use, if you wanna run these platforms, you have to send the samples to the company. They're not gonna sell you your own machine and support you. So we kind of like having control over quality and QCing things and developing new tools and assays. And we don't have to wait for our samples to be sent away and come back which you do with these companies, and they charge a lot of overhead beyond what it would cost if they would just let us have the machine, and they do not. So those are just some thoughts about these sort of three products and why we like the kind of array at the University of Toledo. Of course, everybody in the room knows about the kind of array, but I'm not sure that everybody at home does, so I included one slide before we jump into all these fancy data analyses. Um, of course, there's a metal oxide sort of resin. The, the peptides are printed on this in an array style where each spot is the same peptide and depending on the chip there's 144 or 196 uh, unique spots there's quality control spots what we have here is an example of a control sample and a schizophrenia sample run side by side you can see for example this spot is way brighter than this spot we can show differential activity levels in a heat map um, down here we just have a couple of curves that are showing time of acquisition of the signal and sort of the the reads of the intensity of the signal off the chip. And then this data can be processed for each of these spots, each spot representing a different peptide. You know what the peptide is, you can start to say something uh, about what's going on in your biological sample. Um, just as an aside, a lot of the stuff you're gonna see today um, in terms of our use case examples is from brain homogenous. And people always ask me, well, Rob, what if that brain has, uh, you know, somebody passed away and they're in an alley or a hotel bed or their car or whatever. We talk about that being the postmortem interval. I can tell you that human brains with the postmortem interval less than 20 hours give a very similar level of intensity as a what we'll call a fresh rodent brain that doesn't have a postmortem interval. So we're very com confident with this. We published this sort of observation two or three times in peer reviewed journals. So it's a nice thing. A um, couple more slides before I turn it over to our first trainee. Um, there's a lot of substrates that we've personally run, and then I know there's more that here at PamGene and some of your other customers have run. Cell culture homogenous, brain homogenous, liver homogenous, myriad animal models, recombinant kinases, and now recombinant phosphatases on the phosphatase experimental chip. We've done knockdown activation studies, um, 
and miscellaneous sample types, including sperm, zebrafish heads. Um, oh, what's the other one that's fun to mention? Oh, molecular fluid from ovaries. So we have a collaborator at Northwestern University who is a very skilled fertility doctor who's always extracting eggs, and she's able to get little tiny bits of follicular fluid um, out of these follicles. And there's actually a very robust signal uh, in these samples. And she's studying the difference between uh, people with sort of ovarian failure or endometriosis and normal controls. It's a really nice study. So a lot of sample types work well on the array with this type of workflow. Um, the last thing I want to mention before we turn it over uh, to the next speaker is sort of the way we think about um, workflow for our collaborators and our customers. And the first question is, should you do it? Do you need a functional proteomics readout to either generate a hypothesis or test a hypothesis? If the answer is yes, is protein kinase activity something that will be informative for you? You know, should you or shouldn't you do it is always the first question. Do you have a specific hypothesis or do you want to generate a hypothesis? That's also part of the discussion. At the micro level, we talk about the experimental design. We have characteristic ways we like to design experiments that work well for the setup on the machine. It can hold three chips at a time. Each chip has four wells. So there's a lot of convenience factors that go into designing an experiment. The technical level of sample preparation. Uh, Abdul, who's online, is our technical uh, sample guy. And of course, everything we've learned, we've learned from many of the people in the room over the years. Um, so Eddie and, and his colleagues are experts in how to prepare these samples and how to process them. And I would refer anybody to him if he has questions. We don't have a talk set up for that today. Um, then the next thing we get when we run the machine is peptide level data. And of course, some of the protocols for generating biomarkers and biomarker panels rely on peptide level data. And Hunter is going to share uh, his project that's going to use peptide level data. One of the most interesting things is how you go from peptides to kinases. Um, Ali Amami is going to talk about his deconvolution strategies, and I think it's a, a really interesting talk, and then there's a lot of cutting edge stuff there. We also generate uh, model level data a couple of different ways. We're not going to talk about that today. The simplest way is with a protein protein interaction network that we have an automated sort of output of that in one of our uh, uh, results reports. A more complicated way is to use a Bayesian network uh, model, which is more sophisticated. The next thing we talk about with our customers is integrating data. Often they've run RNA sequencing or proteomics. And Billy Ryan, uh, he's spending most of his PhD time uh, learning how to come up with the best way to integrate kinomics data with other types of omics data. It's an exciting thing. Then once you get to this point, often you want to confirm things. And Abdul is going to give a talk on a really nice confirmation study that we ran uh, on the Dark Kinome Project. And then snuck in there somewhere, Sean is going to give a short talk about his phosphatase data. And then, of course, the last thing we talk about with our customers and collaborators is deliverables. Basic scientists want to know the answer, right? They're, they don't live in our studio and coding and printing chips and worrying about quality control. They want to know, all right, what are the kinases? What are the top five kinases? What's the top pathway? What's going on in the sample? So we talk, spend a lot of time talking about deliverables and providing deliverables for our customers and our collaborators. And Pam Jean does as well, I know, because we've worked with them for so many years. The other deliverable that I'll mention, which is relevant to all the talks you're going to see, is at least in my field, your results that you're given need to fit in a paper or the output is a network that's the size of this wall. I can't put that in a grant. That's not you know, actionable. That's really hard to share with a review panel or a review committee. It's hard to communicate that to a broader audience. And most of the journals we publish in don't allow for interactive figures yet in terms of publishing, which is disappointing because we're always making them and then we can't submit them that way. So the deliverable is not just what's the answer, but usable figures for our clients, consumers, for our customers, for our collaborators. So I'm gonna stop there and we're gonna turn over the floor to uh, Ali. Um, you can go ahead and pull up the slides if you can find them. Um, I'll tell you who Ali is. Ali has uh, an MD uh, from his home country of Pakistan and he joined us in the United States a number of years back as a Fulbright scholar and joined the bioinformatics program at the University of Toledo. When he finished that, he twisted his arm and made him join the PhD program. And so he's now in, I think, your second year of the PhD program, third year of the PhD program. So he's a senior PhD candidate. He's going to talk to you about D 
deconvolution and taking peptide level data to answers. Ali? Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that wonderful introduction. Hi, everyone, uh, and hi, everyone that's seeing me through the camera on my left. Uh, I'm going to talk about deconvolution strategies. It's beyond peptides. And we're going to start off with some uh, building blocks here. Uh, there was a disclosure slide, but just for a reference, I don't have any disclosures to make. I'm a grad student. I don't make any money. Um, so for building blocks, there are a couple of things that I'm going to refer back to. Uh, and I want to make sure that we have the same understanding. First thing is the upstream and downstream. What is upstream? What is downstream? Think of them as cause and effect. Something that is upstream is the cause. Something that is downstream of that is the effect. Uh, gene expression versus activity, and it's just activity, not gene activity, but you're counting different things. You are calculating how much action is happening versus how many pieces you have. So it would be like seeing Lego blocks and thinking about what the Lego set is versus how many pieces it has. And this last thing is deconvolution. Uh, that's uh, identifying, it's a, it's a loaded bioinformatics term classically used when you're trying to figure out single cell expression from bulk RNA-seq data. Here we use it to make sure that it's, uh, how do we identify the kinases that we're looking for? Mm -hmm. So what's the state of the art generally now? Uh, First thing is we collect samples. They could be sperm samples or uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells or my favorite brain tissue. Mm -hmm. But you take from that and then you go to the, you run it on the kinase dynamic. It gives you a nice little signal. You move on and you report some results. At this point, this is generally what it looks like. This is the output from a uh, PAM chip assay. This is an SDK chip. This is signal intensity plotted against time. And this is group differences between the two groups that we're interested in. But that's just peptides. Peptides were phosphorylated by kinases, but which kinases? How do we find that out? This is a nice little heat map. You see the peptides on the y-axis. On the x-axis, each column is a single sample. We're going to introduce this data set a little later because we're going to use this throughout. But this is control versus schizophrenia, a case control data set. And you can see uh, that there are peptide level changes. We can stop here. This allows us for, to do pathway analysis. This also allows us to uh, make a signature. Uh, even allows you to make some sort of a biomarker if you're looking for it. But we're still interested in the kinases. So is there more to the uh, peptide level results? The answer is, of course. So uh, the process I'm talking about is the upstream kinase identification, aka deconvolution. The goal here is to identify which kinases phosphorylated the target peptides. There are multiple techniques to do that. Almost all of them are computational, and it's a very difficult process. One of the things that makes it difficult is that for any given peptide, not even just restricting us to the peptides on the array, any given peptide can be phosphorylated by multiple kinases. The kinases are promiscuous. Each kinase will phosphorylate multiple peptides. And when you're not dealing with a recombinant kinase, a pure single purified protein kinase on the chip, you are definitely seeing the result of some kinase-kinase interaction. Because there's ATP, there's kinase, and the kinases work as a network. One can autophosphorylate, the other one works in a 
in cascade, the other ones work in a network. So one of the things, one of the corollaries from this is that we can't really at this point identify that this peptide was definitely in this sample, this peptide was definitely phosphorylated by this kinase. We can still identify a global idea of how uh, many kinases and how much they were involved. But going to just a kinase to peptide mapping is practically impossible. Looking at these uh, list of solutions, and these are all, I'm going to uh, uh, go over these. One of the things uh, is why I don't have full names of these was that this has a ridiculously long name and it didn't fit on my slide. Uh, so you have UCA, PERSA, KEA3, and uh, PTMSCA, and we rounded up with pre-enzymatic, which is a surprise for the end of this. I'm going to use a demonstration data set. Uh, it's one of my favorite data sets from our lab. Uh, it's a primary data set with neurons that were laser captured, micro dissected from schizophrenia and matched controls. There are six cases versus six controls. These are pyramidal neurons from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we're looking for differences between schizophrenia and controls. So the first thing on the list, because we're at BAM gene, is yuca. Thank you. <laughs> also known as upstream kinase analysis. Uh, who makes it? BAM gene. Uh, and thank you for that, because it's a fantastic tool. What, how do you access this? It says a graphical interface through the BioNavigator software, the logo you see in that corner there. It uses a database that is sort of proprietary and curated. It uses multiple sources, including GPS3, Phospho-ELM, Phosphocyte Plus, HPRD, Reactome. And there's a very high stringency here. If Yuka gives you a result, you can be confident that that is a hit. There's very few false positives you'll see there. And what's the granularity? What are the results that this gives you? Gives you to the individual kinase level. This is an example of that. Uh, this is the same data set, the heat map that you saw earlier, the one that I described before. And this is the volcano plot, one of the outputs from Yuka that you see. And it's giving me PIM3 and PIM1, PKG1, check one as big hits. And I am convinced that these are definitely some involved. I can go back to literature, find out. I can go back to the bench and find out, but these are definitely involved. Next thing on the list, and that is because it's ours, is PERSA, or Kinome Random Sampling Analyzer. It's open source, but developed by the Cognitive Disorders Research Lab. It's an R package, uh, which you can download off of GitHub and use, or you can come to us and we'll give you a nice little PDF report that has everything written on it uh, in an easy to understand way. Uh, we use these databases. Some of them overlap with Yuka, some of them do not. It has a medium stringency. This is more geared towards discovery level experiments rather than a laser focused hypothesis. So you want to look at as many candidates as possible without losing any. So we don't care if there are a few false positives. And what is the granularity? Because of the nature of how we curated this database, uh, we get to kinase families and subfamilies. We do not go to the individual kinase level. Is that a problem? If you're just using PERSA, probably, but not really if you're going through the entire list as we are. PERSA uses uh, a methodology that's called permutation analysis. How does that work? On this screen, you see this little histogram pop up. Uh, you and it's DNPK. What you're looking at is how many, uh, how many peptides on the chip can be phosphorylated by DMBK? You take that number and you identify which ones were phosphorylated after that, say that's 10. And then you take a random sample of 10 peptides, 
2,000 times and see how many of them map to DMPK. That 2,000 time list by the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem will give you a normal distribution that is an empirical distribution that will give you a mean, how many times you expect it to show up, and the standard deviation, how much do you expect it to deviate. And once that happens, you can take your 10 peptides that map to DMPK and see how unusual that is in the matter of a Z-score. That Z-score tells you how important that kind is, family or subfamily is in your sample. This is a waterfall plot which shows you which the top 15 kinases that were involved. Uh, if you look at this one, PKCI, it has a z-score higher than 2, which makes it a pretty good candidate. There's others that are higher than 1.5, including Tau, MOS, AKT. Many of them, uh, including AKT, we've published before, are involved in schizophrenia. Next item on the list is KDA3, or Kinase Enrichment Analysis, third edition. Uh, it's also an open source package. Uh, it's developed by the Mayan lab. You could, again, potentially download that, but it's much easier to use because there's both a website that you can go and put your list in manually and a web server if you want to just repeatedly talk to it and identify the results. So you can have a computer do that for you. It uses more than 20 databases, practically every database that we have. And again, it's public data curated. This also has a medium stringency, more appropriate for discovery based experiments. And it gives you an individual protein level uh, granularity. This is KDA3's homepage. Once you get there, this is the list of proteins it goes here. And this is a moving GIF that just shows you what it's doing. And I'm honestly very impressed by how they keep this service running. Uh, these are the results from uh, the same input data set, but from KEA3. Last but not least is the post-translation modification signal enrichment analysis, quite a mouthful. Uh, this comes from the Broad Institute, and they came up with the original GSEA algorithm, the gene set enrichment analysis. This is a modified GSEA uh, system algorithm with a different database that lets you uh, look at post translational modifications. Uh, they have a web server that you can talk to through software. There's an R package. Uh, they, on their website, on the Broad Institute, they talk about there's a website as well. I've never been able to get that to work. Uh, there's the, this mark of distinction here is that their data set, their database is PDM DB, which is their primary data. They generated that through mass spectrometry, a huge number of experiments done. It is also very stringent. If it gives you a hint, you can be sure that that is a hit. Mm. And this gives you an individual kinase level resolution. And this is because they don't really have, uh, they leave the visualization to everyone else, so they don't really have a canonical visualization. So this is the results for my data set that I showed earlier for PTMSEA. Now you're seeing these four tools, and you can see some of them are the common uh, denominators, but many of them are not. There is disparate, disparate groups. Some are in two, some are in just one. How do you choose which tool? And that's a, that's a hard problem. How do we choose? The thing is you don't have to. Why don't you have to? Well, because of this guy. Uh, Justin Preden uh, graduated with his MD PhD a couple of years ago from our lab. He came up with this credenzomatic visualization technique um, in a paper that my colleague Hunter will show uh, in his talk. But that technique allows you to look at a consensus across the four 
systems. And it allows you to prioritize high value targets. This is the bubble plot from the pre enzymatic figure. Each dot here is part of, like, it signifies which quartile it is uh, they think belongs to. If it's a filled circle, that means that that tool had that as a hit. These are all four tools. On the bottom, you see individual protein kinases. On the top, these are kinase families. If you look at this, you will see that CDK2, which is quartile four in two of them, higher quartiles better, and quartile three in two others. Here, same distribution, two plus two, uh, two, four, and two, uh, three, third quartile. These are these pop up to you immediately. If you're looking for the answer, the answer, you can just look at that and it should give you something that you can chase down. If you're looking for a hypothesis confirmation, you know that there are kinases that are involved in it. You can look at those. But this gives you a nice way to concisely, visually correlate all the data. And uh, as Dr. Smith said, this needs to fit. And this is actually, this is the same size. This is seven and a half inches in reality. So it will fit on a single uh, letter sized paper with half inch margins. To sum it all up, the problem that we face is we have peptide level data, but how do we go to kinases? There are lots of ways to do that, and we don't have to stick to one. Mm -hmm. We can use all of them, and we can combine their strengths while having each tool cover the other's weakness. It gives you an overall, a more robust, a more stringent, mm -hmm. a better answer. And to just round it all up, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Smith, who's been my mentor for the past four years, uh, Dr. Miller, uh, Dr. Hamoud, Dr. Alganam, who worked tirelessly on our Tynomore platform, everyone in our lab, which is Cognitive Disorders Research Lab. Uh, this is my family, uh, Sadia, Romana, and Samara, my two daughters, and my wife. Uh, and if they hadn't been there, this talk wouldn't be here. I'd also like to thank the University of Toledo for giving me the opportunity to be uh, to do this site kind of research and the Fulbright Commission to make sure that I came here. Uh, thank you. And I think we have time for a question. I don't know if there's a question remote or in the room. Yeah, thank you all for joining in. We can answer maybe one or two questions. If if you raise your hand, if you make a chat for Mark, we can we can show your question. There's one question. All right. Yeah. Hi, Ali, and very nice job. Uh, I you. think it's a uh, nice when you you use four different databases to show how upstream kinase analysis can be done. And one of the questions we usually get from our client is how well we can differentiate using UCA different family members from certain kinase. We showed on your slide CDK and they were like CDK 1, 2, 3, 4. But when, when I look at all four of these programs, they were like more or less so, all the way the same. Is, it, is there a way to figure out or zoom in into more? You can zoom in, but usually family members tend to be around this like work pretty similarly because they are there because of functional and sequence similarity. But if there is a significant difference, I don't have that data here, but we have seen that the bubble plot will show one family member with a fourth quartile and the next family member will have a first quartile circle. So this does differentiate between them. It all depends on what data's input. 
We have one question online from Wim van der Bergen. Yeah, that's Antwerp. Thank you, Wim, to be here. <laughs> you should be able to speak now. Okay, so do you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. yes, so thank you for your interesting presentation. So uh, what you discuss mainly is like you have like two disease, like a healthy or a disease condition, and you compare like baseline differences in kinome activity. So if you imagine about a uh, context, for example, a cancer sample treated with kinase inhibitors in, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a condition of therapy, so then we are also have another parameter, the time dynamics, because depending so if you have ex vivo samples or organoids and you do it in presence or absence of a kinase inhibitor, then you also have the time dimension. And this can also change the network activity of the kinases. So how can you include this in your algorithms? Or yeah, what is the appropriate time? So do you have filters to include some time samples or exclude time samples? So that generally depends on your experimental design. We have worked with that. That is very domain and uh, I would say experiment therapy specific. There's going to be different time points that should be there. Uh, and I'm not an expert in cancer, but uh, the person who's running the experiment probably is. They can decide which is which. Uh, oh, let, me, let me take yeah. jump in. William, hi, this is uh, Robert Smith. Nice to meet you. Yes. So, yeah, we have uh, collaborators that do time course experiments with two and three cultures. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, what we typically do is set up a freestanding experiment at each time point, mm -hmm. say six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, and zero hours, plus and minus their drug. Mm -hmm. And then we, we run the bioinformatics at each time point and then compare them cross-sectionally. Yeah, I don't know if that helps, but that's what we've been the strategy we've been using for yeah. that type of experiment you explained. Yeah, it's because sometimes what we see is we see some time dependent changes like hyper hyperactivation or uh, hyper repression. But at sometimes at particular time points, we see like a complete shift. So from hyperactivation to hyper repression, uh, it's like massive. Uh, and so we are sometimes wondering what is happening is yeah, why we see this complete shifting in kinase network and then which one we should focus on to understand the biology <laughs> or we should look at both networks. Maybe well, one, of the, one of the challenges, um, many types of experiments like you're describing ultimately kill the cells. Hmm. And as, as you may or may not know, dead cells have active kinases. Hmm. So you have to be careful um, if you've killed all the cells and you're measuring dead cells versus, you know, uh, vehicle control can treat cells, you get a um, sort of a false positive read. Mm -hmm. So we're really careful with that when we work with our collaborators in particular. And so we make sure that they know the percent viable cells at every time point, And we avoid the time points where viability has gotten too low. So we don't want to be measuring dead cells or dead cell lysates. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Wim. Great okay. question. Then there's one other question from Malta. Yeah, a small question from Malta. So come I'm in, Malta, please. Right. <laughs> should be able to talk. So. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Malta. Okay. Uh, here's Malta from Hamburg. Hello. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I just have a question. Um, when you have different results with your different deconvolution techniques, uh, did you try to validate some of these results, for example, this Western blot or whatever, to see um, which techniques gives you more, maybe false positive hits or something like that? Well, I'll, I'll let Dr. Smith take this question. Yeah, I'll leave, I'll, we don't let Ali in the lab very often. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I stay here like a buster. Stay here on a Western blot. Uh, I, what I would say is that we have confirmed selected hits. What we have not done is gone back and sort of reverse fit which platform uh, is the most predictable. So that's something we haven't done. Um, but we've had good success moving, advancing hits forward using the bubble plot as one of the advancement criteria to take a hit forward into uh, the next step. Mm -hmm. I would say roughly 
um, overall without getting into which technique is being used, which deconvolution technique. I would say 70 to 80 percent of our hits have been confirmed, either with phospholestrin blot mass spec, a different kind of array approach, or an enzyme activity assay. Yeah, and just to add to that, going back and reverse engineering which of these techniques, like benchmarking them, doesn't make a lot of sense, but completely different. So it just gets very, very mathematically iffy, I should say, to reverse engineer that, oh, this is a benchmark. <laughs> Probably need to keep moving. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, thanks, Malt. Very great, great question. Question. Thank you. So, our next speaker is not present here at the mothership in Den Bosch, and he's very sad about that. Um, uh, we left Abdul back in sunny Toledo. That's a joke. It's been raining for three days. Um, but that's okay. Um, Abdul Hamoud is uh, a very senior. Uh, PhD candidate in the lab. He is uh, very involved in a lot of our confirmation studies and biochemical assays, um, Western blots, mass spectrometry, uh, kinase activity assays. And um, we're going to pull him up here. Here we go. Yeah. Um, so I'm Abdul Hamoud. Um, thank you for the introduction, Rob. I'll say slide each time I change the slide. So, slide. So, actually, um, then we should start with some nomenclature basic definitions. Um, what exactly is a dark kinase? A dark kinase is a kinase that is poorly studied. So very few substrates are have been identified for these um, kinases. And the NIH is illuminating the druggable genome, IDG, lists 162 total dark kinases. We have here on the right um, is basically a um, graph representation of that, right? So what you see in the um, reddish color is the dark kinases relative to a majority of what we know as light kinases. Um, this is a basic ball model. On the next slide, it's a basic ball model showing the um, interactions between various kinases. And of course, the point here is that um, you're not going to have a dark kinase be present within a ball model because the interactions are not known, right? So we will have more confidence in uh, total kinase signaling and network analyses if we do a better job of mapping all of these kinases. And only about 6% of the total fossil proteome is reliably mapped by kinases. And so a lot of legwork needs to be done here in identifying substrates uh, for kinases. This project initially was brought to our attention um, because of this paper that was published by a few of our friends at Pangene, uh, namely Tushard Tomer, um, in which they screened a number of recombinant proteins, uh, PKGs namely, to better understand retinal degeneration, right? Um, and Khalil al Ghanem, who graduated last year, um, found this paper in the literature, shared it with me and said, hey, we've done something similar um, with your PIM kinases, right? Where we've taken recombinant proteins and we've screened them on a serine 3 knee chip. And so this is PIM kinase 3. We have done PIM 1 and PIM 2, and I'm showing PIM 3 here. Um, and we screen this recombinant protein at three different concentrations, right? So you can see my cursor. On the far left, what we have is 0.25 nanograms of total protein for recombinant PIM 3. And then we have 2.5 nanograms of total protein for PIM3. And then we have 25 nanograms of total PIM3. And the far right column is heat inactivated. So what does heat inactivation mean? Heat inactivation means that we essentially denature the protein, right? You basically take your sample, you put it on a heating block, denature the protein, it shouldn't be active. And what you'll see is that there's more yellow in that column. Yellow meaning decrease possible sites at all of these different peptides. And the peptides are represented as the rows, right? So each of those rows are a single site, a single peptide sequence, and the ones in red are phosphorylated, right? And what you'll see as we increase the total protein from left to right, 
more and more peptides are being recruited. And in this experiment, now what we did is we were able to identify five high affinity peptides, a few of which were not in the literature, only two were recognized in the literature. And so recognizing this as a powerful way to identify substrates for various proteins, we decided to pitch it to Dr. Smith, right? So the pitch goes as follows. The idea was, um, you know, there's poorly studied kinases, kinases that are not well mapped at all, uh, that we're calling dark, that we can identify from the literature. We can take these kinases, either, you know, generate them ourselves, purify it, or purchase it from a vendor, and screen them on the PEM chips, from which we can identify novel substrates. We can then validate this kinase is actually phosphorylating its downstream target. I'll explain that later on in the presentation. And then we can use these findings to not only build these databases, some of which Ali touched upon, um, but also to understand uh, psychiatric disorders, namely schizophrenia. So here's our research workflow. What we have on the far left is an example of a dark kinase that would have a few known interactions, right? It's poorly studied. Perhaps it's mapped to some degree, right? We would purchase, or we would take our purified recombinant protein, and then we would begin to screen them at various concentrations on the PEM chip, right? So let's say hypothetically we use the PTK chip. So it's a chip that has the tyrosine residues being phosphorylated by your sample. Uh, we would have our heat inactivated control where we don't expect to get a signal. And then we have our three concentrations. And that would generate a heat map, which you see in the center there, right? Again, rows would be the various peptides that are being phosphorylated and the columns being your different samples. And the findings from this would inform the databases that we have listed up top, right? So Indra would be the literature. I'll touch, touch, touch on that in a little bit. Dark kinase knowledge base, strings from protein protein interaction, so on and so forth, right? Um, and then next, we could extend the knowledge network. Again, we have new peptides. And so we could say that our dark kinase is interacting with these proteins, these kinases, so on and so forth. Um, additionally, we can take case control samples. This is something we've done in this study, I'll show a little bit later on uh, for schizophrenia and age sex match controls run them on the array, and then try to determine the uh, changes in activity for our dark kinase within our sample. Okay. And then finally, you end up with your disease network, dark kinase interactors, and then you could tie that back to various biological processes. So how do we identify which dark kinases we should focus on? Okay, so this is the same figure talked about earlier. Um, this is Indra. Indra basically is a tool to tell us about how well studied a particular gene is. And in this case, it's a kinase, right? How well studied are these kinases? How popular are they? Um, and it's a, basically a text mining tool that pulls from PubMed abstracts. Um, and each statement does not correspond to a single substrate, but the total number of entries does tell us about how well studied they are. And on the left, we have our dark kinases, right? And the rest kind of shows you the distribution of the other kinases. So if we kind of blow that up and look at our list of dark kinases that we started with, we decided to restrict the dark kinases uh, to tyrosine kinases so we could run them on the PTK chips. Um, and we have a you know, relatively long list of kinases that are poorly studied. We chose five kinases based on expression patterns. So we wanted them to be expressed in the brain um, whether or not we could actually get our hands on it, so availability. Um, and we ended up with these five, LTK, AATK, INSRR, TNK1, and EPHA6. Um, another tool that we use to determine whether or not we should um, screen these kinases is IPTMNET. So IPTMNET actually tells us about the substrates, right? And so this is an example here on the right for AKT1. Uh, if you search for AKT1 entries in IPTMNET just for Homo sapiens, um, under substrate role, you have 28 enzymes. So that tells us that as a substrate, AKT1 is phosphorylated at 28 different sites. As an enzyme, in terms of its downstream targets, it has 207 entries. 
um, in terms of the post-translational modification dependent protein-protein interactions, it has 17 interactions um, listed, a total of 64 sites. And so the second bullet point that I have there is it contains eight types of post-translational modifications, not just phosphorylation, although we are just interested in phosphorylation for the purposes of this, pro uh, this project. Uh, so the punchline here is that AKT1 is very light. Right? It's as light as you can get. Um, it's really well studied, has all types of downstream targets that have been well characterized. Signal networks are pretty well understood. Um, compare that to a dark kinase, right? So this is EPHA6. Um, basically, nothing is listed. There are 14 sites at which there is some sort of post-translational modification, and then there's three isoforms. Besides that, none, not much is known. And so a kinase like this is a pretty good candidate to carry forward in our screening of the tyrosine kinases. So we did this for all of our, our list of dark kinases, and we ended up with these five. Um, again, TNK1, EPHA6, LTK, INSRR, and AATK, um, all of which are very poorly studied. Right? And on the right, what we have is a phylogenetic tree. So this is a tree that classifies kinases based on sequence, right? So based on the catalytic domains and the kinase domains. You can see they fall into various groupings. We have the CAM kinases towards the bottom. This is where our PIM kinases that I showed earlier would fall into. Uh, we have our STEs, tyrosine kinase-like family, and then we have our tyrosine kinases. And this is where our five kinases fall on the phylogenetic tree at the very top there. So this is um, the screening of EPHA6. Like before, as I mentioned, we have on the far left column of our heat map, 250 nanograms of EPHA6 that was heat inactivated. So we do not expect this kinase to be active at all in our sample. And you can see the yellow indicates less phosphorylation compared to the others, right? Um, and then we have increasing concentration, increasing total protein, I should say, of EPHA6, ranging from 2.5 nanograms to 250 nanograms, somewhere in the nanogram range because the array is very sensitive, right? Um, and the PCA plot here on the right shows the clustering of each of these peptides, right, into high, medium, and low affinity peptides. Uh, the high is indicated in red, um, the low is in green, and the medium is in blue. That's also indicated on the heat map on the left. You can see that there are various breaks on the heat map showing the peptides that are um, phosphorylated at high, medium, and low affinities. On the right, what we have is a signal intensity plot. So the signal intensity plot essentially shows that from the lowest concentration to the highest concentration, we see increased phosphorylation. Um, and on the bottom there, we have our peptide logo, right, for each of the clusters. It's low, medium, and high affinity. Um, importantly, these sequence logos are useful because nothing exists for them currently, right? No downstream targets have been identified for them. So if we were to go to Fossil Site Plus, for example, and try to figure out the sequence logo or the downstream targets, nothing would be there. And so we generate, generated it ourselves. Um, last point I want to make here is that you'll find that there are a lot of peptides being phosphorylated by EPHA6. In contrast, if you look at our next kinase, which is LTK, very few kinase, very few peptides were phosphorylated uh, by LTK. So on the left, again, heat inactivated sample, you shouldn't get phosphorylation. And then we have increasing phosphorylation or increased total protein of LTK. You can see very few peptides uh, report on LTK activity. And so this is a far more selective kinase for its downstream targets. Uh, for our PCA plots, we have the high, medium, and low affinity um, peptides identified. Only in the high range are we able to show the uh, sequence or the signal intensity increase. And then we have our high and low medium affinity peptides uh, sequence logos as well. So we did this for all five. I'm not showing all, all five. I just showed the um, two kinases for the sake of time. Um, so we can ask how selective are these kinases, right? So we're really asking about chip coverage here. So if we look at our two kinases that I shared on the bottom left is EPHA6. The 73% of the peptides on the array did not report on EPHA6 activity. 27% were phosphorylated to some degree. And in that 27%, it's broken down into high, medium, and low affinity peptides. Uh, similarly, in the middle, we have LTK, where 97% of the array 
does not report on LTK activity. Only 3% does, and the breakdown is there for high, medium, and low 50 peptides. Um, by the way, a total the total number of peptides on the PTK chip is 193, so this is out of 193. And so when we look at the peptides that are shared, this is an upset plot, right? So essentially, each of the rows here towards the bottom shows a particular condition, right? So we have LT, let's start at the bottom, actually. Let's look at AATK medium affinity peptides. So that would be considered a set. And in that set, you have a bar plot in which it tells you how many peptides are within that particular group. And you'll notice for some of these, there's a line connecting one group to the other. So that tells you about the intersection right, or the overlap between those two groups. So for our first conditions where there's overlap, we have AATK medium affinity peptides and INSRR low affinity peptides. I believe there are four in that group. Um, but the punchline here is for a majority of the high affinity peptides, um, they're not shared. So they're relatively selective compared to one another. And so we've identified by screening these five kinases, downstream targets, peptides at least. Um, and so what we did is we took those peptides and we map them to various proteins. We purchased the protein, and we wanted to do a validation experiment, right? So EPHA6 is one that I shared, so I'm showing EPHA6 here. Um, one of our high affinity peptides mapped to a protein called GAB1, and so what we did is a benchtop activity assay. So we took the PAM gene PTK protocol in the reagents, and we essentially replicated the activity assay, but instead of loading the samples on the chip, we just loaded it in a 96 well plate, and then we popped it into an incubator for 30 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius. Right, so we have a master mix from combinant GAB1 and EPHA6. We then took this sample and then we ran it on a Western blot. Right, and I'll show you those results here shortly. Just ran it on the gel. We wanted to see if there were changes in phosphorylation state for our our downstream target of interest, and then we sent it off for mass spec. So starting with the Western blot, right, we have EPHA6 and GAB1, again, co-incubated um, in some of our samples and not in others. And so for the first column, what we have is EPHA6 at 250 nanograms of total protein. And this is EPHA6 by itself, right? And you can see a strong band showed up where we expect EPHA6 to be. Next, what we did is we ran EPHA6, but this time it was heat inactivated EPHA6, right? So we heat inactivated first, then we added the master mix, and then put it in the incubator, and we ran that sample as well. And you'll notice, excuse me, is that the total signal is diminished. And I should mention here that the antibody that we use to detect this signal is a pan-phosphotyrosine antibody, right? So if there is a tyrosine residue phosphorylated at any of these sites, it's going to be recognized, right? And so the total phosphorylation signal decreased in the heat inactivated sample. So what does that tell us? That tells us that EPHA6 autophosphorylates when it's active. And here, when it's denatured, it wasn't able to autophosphorylate, and so you see a reduced signal. Next, for the next three columns, what we did is we took 250 nanograms of EPHA6, and then we also co-incubated with increasing concentrations of GAB1, or downstream target. And so it is 200, 300, and 400 nanograms. And you can see in these three columns, we see a band show up for GAB1, right? So that tells us that EPHA6 is phosphorylating GAB1, right? Um, and then lastly, what we have is the highest concentration of GAB1. So total protein is 400 nanograms, co-incubated with EPH6, EPH, EPHA6 at 250 nanograms that has been denatured. So inactive EPHA6 and 400 nanograms of GAB1. And you see that we lose the signal for um, not just GAB1, but also for EPHA6 for the most part. And so that tells us that GAB1 is being phosphorylated by active EPHA6 and it doesn't come phosphorylated, right? On the right, we have a spectral map showing all the different peptides. Um, for our downstream target, as well as EPHA6 that was sent out for sequencing. Um, and then we have a peptide sequence table here showing us the actual sites at which EPHA6 and GAB1 are phosphorylated, right? 
So for GAB1, our downstream target, we have four fossil sites that we're able to identify. And if you look closely, the second from the bottom, there's a set of peptides or a set of amino acids that I've underlined. And I've underlined that because that is actually present on the chip. So one of the peptides that we identified as reporting on EPHA6 activity, we went back, we mapped it to GAB1, we did this experiment, we sent it off for mass spec, and we identified that it is indeed being phosphorylated by EPHA6 at that very site, right? Um, and then those are the autophosphorylation sites for EPHA6 mm -hmm. at the top there. Lastly, we have a map here showing the actual sites at which EPHA6 autophosphorylates and it phosphorylates GAB1. And I've mapped that basically to the various domains on the protein, was from Uniprot. Um, the EPHA6 is autophosphorylating um, towards the N terminus and towards the C terminus for GAP1. Okay, so moving on from there, if you remember our workflow, um, we talked about taking our findings from these dark kinases and then using it to better understand disease states, right? And our disease state of interest would be schizophrenia, since we're a psychiatric lab. So we did another experiment. This is separate from the dark kinase, in which we prepared samples um, from age, sex, pH, and postpartum interval matched subjects. Where PMI means how long has the you know patient been, has passed away until the samples are processed or harvested. Um, and so they've been matched for base demographic and biological factors. Um, we pulled these samples based on age, sex, in case in disease state. Um, they're homogenized, and the samples are from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These are tissue sections. They're not single cells, so they're multicellular samples. Um, and we ran them in triplicate at one microgram per microliter on three PTK PAM chips, um, when I'm showing the data for the uh, female subjects only. And so this is a heat map similar to one that Ali showed in the earlier presentation. Um, if we look at our legend, we have control females versus schizophrenia females. And you'll see at the top there, the dendrogram, we have blue and pink, I suppose. Um, and the pinkish, the reddish color uh, shows decreased activity almost across the board for the schizophrenia patients, while there's increased activity in the control patients, right? And this is the uh, changes in kinase activity shown as a branch from the phylogenetic tree that I showed earlier. So how can we interpret this? Uh, well, one way to do this is the pedenzymatic bubble plot that Ali introduced. Um, and I'm showing this not to talk about these kinases or these kinase families, but to point out that our dark kinases are not and cannot be part of this analysis, right? Just because they're not mapped. And if they're not mapped, they're not gonna be in the database. So you won't find any of the five tyrosine kinases that I mentioned towards the bottom here. You'll find plenty of other kinases, and these are all like kinases that are well studied, and so we can gauge their activity in our samples of interest. So how do we actually determine activity for our kinases of interest? We're going to need to go back, take our peptides that we identified on the array, and then basically look at the changes between cases and controls. So if we look at our females, you'll see that almost across the board, there's decreased activity or decreased phosphorylation at all these sites for the, ca for the cases as compared to the controls. And so we can say more confidently now that EPHA6 activity is decreased in female subjects in schizophrenia as compared to control subjects. So what is the takeaway here? Um, the takeaway here is that dark kinases, which are kinases that are poorly studied, um, and oftentimes they're poorly studied due to technical constraints, or perhaps um, the kinases that have been studied have been studied because of their relevance in um, fields like cancer or metabolic disorders or any of those other diseases that are um, you know, commonly studied for kinase activity. Um, screening these kinases on the PAM chips can be used as a way to identify downstream targets, assuming there's some validation. Um, one caveat that I wanted to mention is that we've only screened these kinases on the PTK chips. They could very well have serine threonine activity, and so they could be dual specific kinases. Um, and then the downstream targets and the uh, subsequent phosphor or validation can be used to inform protein protein interaction maps. So, again, that is an example on the right um, showing various interactors interacting kinases. Um, the size of the nodes would correspond to how 
well mapped they are, how well studied they are. And so unsurprisingly, if you look at CK or PAC, there's plenty of lines connecting in and out of the PAC kinase family because they're well studied, right? Um, compare that to any of these kinases at around next to SART kinases, right? DMPK, or I can't even make out the other one because it's so small. Those are not as well studied, and so there's very few lines coming out of them. And again, the dark kinases would not even be present on a um, graph or representation like this because we don't know their interactors. And so um, that is yet another reason why studying dark kinases is, is important. Okay, so that is it. Um, I want to thank a few people, of course, the CDRL kinase team, um, Dr. Smith, of course, Ali Mami, uh, Billy Ryan, Hunter Eby, Sean Hanna, um, and of course, Khaled, who um, helped start this entire project. Uh, thank you to Pam Jean for the symposium and for all the help um, along with this team, and I'd be happy to take any questions. We have we are a bit behind schedule, but it's let's okay. keep it dynamic. <laughs> uh, Ali mentioned, uh, yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, it's very interesting. So you mentioned four databases and I mean, sorry, four types of uh, you upstream kinase analysis we can do, and they all source from publicly available knowledge or databases. So do you think that this kind of data that we generate using recombinant kinases, for example, it could be added uh, to this analysis and therefore you pull up these dark kinases also uh, in our samples? Yes, absolutely. So if you screen dark kinases, which I know that you've screened some dark kinases um, at your facility in the past, that can definitely be used to inform kinase activity um, algorithms like the one that Ali mentioned. Um, I understand that some of these databases already use some prediction data. Um, I think some of the bioinformatics people could probably speak better to that. But if you were to do the experiment from A to Z like we did here, validation step would be needed. I don't think it'd be needed for something like uh, what you described. So our next uh, talk will be from Sean Hanna. Sean is an undergraduate uh, junior at the University of Toledo, hoping to go to med school someday. And his honors uh, dissertation is focusing on the experimental, or not for sale, I was told to say that, your experimental in development phosphatase chips. Um, Sean, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, so most of the talks today are focused on kinases. So uh, for my presentation, I'm going to switch over a bit more to phosphatases. Uh, so what's the difference between a kinase and a phosphatase? Well, a kinase attaches a phosphate group to a substrate, usually leading to increased activity, whereas a phosphatase remo removes that phosphate group from the substrate, generally in a, a regulation sense. So uh, Phosphatases are extremely important because without that removal of the phosphate group, you know, a lot of these kinase pathways are going to run unregulated, uh, resulting in uh, issues. So, uh, what are the issues with uh, screening phosphatases? Well, uh, many of the phosphatases in their substrates have a very transient nature in their relationship, so it's very hard to track uh, active dephosphorylation. Along with that, uh, because phosphatases remove the phosphate group from their substrate, we're actively de trying to detect a negative signal. Whereas like with a kinase, you can actively track a, a phosphate group through like a phosphoantibody where you can't really do that with a phosphatase. Additionally, uh, a lot of phosphatases are extremely sensitive where you need very particular environments to uh, correctly track their activity and you know in a in a lab we're limited to only so much we can do and then finally uh there's just an overall underdeveloped understanding of many of the phosphatase pathways so it makes it difficult to do any uh back background uh, research to better develop an experiment so pam jean's ptp uh chip kind of answers some of those uh, difficulties with studying phosphatases, where uh, in the PTP chip, 144 peptide sequences corresponding to various substrates are printed on each well. And on those peptide sequences, a nitro phosphotyrosine group is added to each of the peptide sequences. And that nitrophosphotyrosine group 
allows any phosphatases to uh, target those sequences and actively dephosphorylate it. That nitro uh, tyrosine group that is then left after dephosphorylation allows a anti nitro tyrosine antibody to attach to it, which then a secondary FITC labeled antibody can then attach to that primary, which will allow us to do the general uh, detection that the SDK and the PTK chip then is usually used for. So in this experiment, we used a total biological system with it being uh, normal brain homogenate and an isolated biological sample with recombinant dual specificity, specificity phosphatase one or dusk one. Um, one chip was used for each of the samples. Uh, so there was three uh, concentrations of each uh, as well as a heat inactivated. So starting from the left, uh, there was 600 nanograms of recombinant dust one and then five micrograms of normal brain homogenate. These are the two high concentration uh, samples, and you can see there's an extremely high uh, affinity or very active uh, phosphatases on the on these wells. Uh, moving to the right, we have the medium concentrations of each sample. So we have 500 nanograms of normal brain homogenate and 60 nanograms of recombinant dust one. There you see a bit less activity. Um, and then uh, the final four wells, uh, you have recombinant six nanograms of recombinant dust one. Uh, then the heat inactivated normal brain homogenate and the heat inactivated recombinant dust one. Those are heat inactivated of the highest concentrations. And there you can see there's little to no activity on those chips. So uh, with the information that we received from uh, the recombinant dust one, we pulled the 20, 20 highest affinity peptide sequences uh, that were reported from the dust one activity. And uh, with those reports, we are given a uh, starting residue and end residue that the peptide sequence was used uh, to represent a specific protein. And we used that uh, peptide sequence or amino acid sequence to uh, see if it correctly maps to proteins using a NCAPI blast. And when we did those 20 different searches, 13 unique proteins were identified. Um, so, for example, uh, the chart at the bottom is the results from EDFR, uh, which was one of the uh, 20 top peptides. And there you can see there's about seven different isoforms that that uh, 10 or so amino acid sequence uh, correlated to. So how do we validate uh, these findings of uh, those unique proteins uh, represented by those peptide sequences? Well, as Abdul and Ali had mentioned, there are a good amount of well-developed databases for phosphocytes uh, for kinases, such as Phosphocyte Plus and IPTMNet. However, uh, there doesn't really exist an efficient way to uh, search for phosphatase substrates. For example, uh, one of the only databases I could find is DPOD or the Human Dephosphorylation Database, but it only contains data on about 76% of known phosphatases. Uh, however, using DPOD and just a general literature search, uh, I went through and tried to see if any of the uh, unique proteins were already known substrates of dust one and uh, map map kinase was shown uh, in a few different studies to be a specific substrate of dust one in the uh, journal article below mkp1 is just a different pseudonym of dust one if, if you were wondering uh, so, in conclusion, uh, total brain homogenate and recombinant dust one were ran on the PAM gene phosphatase chip. 13 of the 20 top peptide sequences were mapped to specified correct proteins. And dust one, there's a known dust one substrate among those 20 top peptide sequences. Uh, so, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Smith, uh, Abdul, and Ali for helping me 
uh, with, through this process. So our next speaker is Hunter Evie. Hunter is, of course, in the room today where it happens. And um, that's a good thing because he's enjoying uh, the Netherlands, Amsterdam and Utrecht. Practicing saying that all week, not getting it wrong mostly. And Hunter's an MVP chief candidate at the Department of Neurosciences. And Hunter is going to share with you um, his experimental design for our biomarker development uh, project. And I won't take steal his thunder. Um, we've been collecting samples. We haven't run any chips, but he's going to tell you about this very interesting project. Hunter, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Smith. So once again, my name is Hunter Eby. I'm an MD PhD candidate. Unlike Sean, who's trying to get into medical school, I'm trying to get out, uh, hopefully, in <laughs> one piece. Um, and my lecture, or my talk today, is a, a titled Prediction of Renal Transplant Rejection Using Functional Proteomics. One of the things that we talk about in the lab is deliverables, and we've heard a lot about deliverables today. Can we deliver on a grant? Can we make a good presentation on these kinases? But one of the deliverables that we always talk about in the lab is What's the translation? How is this going to affect patient care? How can we take what we're learning from our technology, from our bench top, and apply it to patient care? So quick uh, conflict of interest disclosure. Uh, Ali uh, pointed out we're grad students. We make no money. We have no conflict of interest. <laughs> uh, quick background on uh, kidney transplant patients. There's currently around 90,000 Americans currently on the kidney transplant waiting list. Um, and every 10 minutes, an individual is added to the kidney registration. So about time after I'm done with this talk, there should be about two patients added to the registration. Average wait time for a kidney is between three to five years after being placed onto the registration. During that three to five years, they'll be going through a dialysis treatment about three to four times a week. And these treatments last three to four hours. So if you imagine just sitting in a chair uh, receiving dialysis for three to four hours, it can be quite, you know, debilitating, be quite time consuming. On the flip side of how many people are added to the registration, the scientific registry of transplant recipients reported over 25 kidney transplants in the year uh, 2022. Studies have shown that acute rejection rate of transplant compatibility patients is around 5 to 7 percent. And when we're, when we're thinking about acute rejection, we're thinking about less than three months. On the flip side of that, chronic rejection rate has stayed at around 20 percent, and the National Health Service and the UK predicts around 15 percent of patients will reject their kidney within the first year. So when we're thinking about chronic rejection anytime after three months. So acute rejection has steadily decreased with the introduction of HLA, ABO matching, and as we've gotten improved at these methods, uh, acute rejection has gone down steadily. Chronic rejection, on the other hand, has remained around this 20% mark. So this is what we're after. These are the individuals that we're really focused on. How can we really get the lifespan out of these kidneys that are donated? How can we really improve this, this longevity of these kidneys in these patients. So that's when we developed the renal kinome team. And the renal kinome team came up with two specific aims. Aim number one, can we identify transplant kinome profiling? Essentially, who's gonna be a rejector? Who's gonna be an acceptor? That's aim one. Aim two, can we use those profiles to modulate the medications, modulate our, modulate our therapies for these patients using some of the techniques that we've used in the past. So first thing I'm going to talk about is how we plan on developing a biomarker profile to predict acceptors and rejectors. And we've seen this before. I'm oh, sorry. So how do, we, how do we start gathering our samples? Well, it all starts in the clinic. And so why do we start in the clinic? Well, we start in the clinic and not in the pre-op area because this is a calm time. Typically, when a patient gets called in for a kidney, it's 3 a.m., the, the surgeon gets a call that there's a kidney available. Surgeon calls the, the patient, says, we have a kidney for you. Stop eating. Please come into the pre-op area. So we meet them in clinic. It's a nice calm day. We consent them. Then surgeon gets a call. It's 3 a.m. And then I get a page and we meet them in clinic. And we meet them in the pre-op area. This pre-op area, they already have to get HLA, ABO matching. We come in. We just add an extra tube. We take it down to the lab. We process it. We isolate the uh, PBMCs. And then we just we we just bank it at our negative 80. Then we'll meet them at three weeks in the clinic and then six months. And the idea for this is that we can have a baseline before the transplant, and then we can see their kinase activity at three weeks and then six months. And we've seen this done before. We've seen how and how uh, teams have studied PBMCs here right here at Pangene. This is a little graph that I like to show where uh, patients are going to go through their after their transplant. They're going to be um, 
as they go through, they're going to be sorted into acceptors and rejectors. And one of the things that we have to come up with is a prediction modeling that's going to accurately predict if someone's an acceptor or a rejector. And we've seen this done here at Pangene. So here at Pangene, they did a study looking at blood-based kinase activities and melanoma patients, specifically looking at the different types of therapies that they were on. And so I wanted to talk about specifically one of the groups that they studied in which they had here in panel A, a discovery group of 10 patients. And the overall finding that they saw was in the responders group, there was an increase in phosphorylation. And so in the non-responders group, they had a decrease in phosphorylation. And this is simply at the peptide level. We haven't even gone into the deconvolution that Ali talked about. We're simply looking at the peptide level data. And clearly simply at the peptide level data, we see a difference between responders and non-responders. And these responders and non-responders are based off the response evaluation criteria for solid tumors. So it's, it's a stringent way to, to classify these patients. So we take, so they took this discovery group, built a model around it, and then they expanded it to a larger population. And they were able to predict around 83% correct if an individual was gonna be a responder or non-responder using PLSDA modeling. So the CDRO caught this and said, how can we, with what we're good at, apply something like this to our lab? And so what are we good at? Well, we're good at whole brain uh, samples. We're good with, you know, we have, a, we have a brain bank. How can we apply that to what we study? So Elizabeth Sedroff, one of our master's students said, we have a lot of kinomic signatures for patients with schizophrenia, as we've presented with Ali, with Abdul. And we said, can we predict simply off the peptide level data if a patient has schizophrenia or if they have the control. So using 19 patients with schizophrenia and 19 control samples from dorsolateral prefrontal cortex kinomic signatures, we started off, we got a pretty good cut here, you know, around 76.3% uh, were correctly classified into schizophrenia control. So we went back to the in silico lab, Ollie went back and, you know, found his little computer, tried to see if we can come up with a better idea. Still using the same samples, we were able to get a nice even cut. A little couple, two, two guys kind of snuck through into the control side. 94% correct classification simply off the peptide level data. This is great. We are able to classify simply based off the disease state. So simply just off the peptide level data, we're, get, we're able to quickly classify if someone's going to um, break off into two groups, which is great. But now we want to deep, do a deeper dive into this. Where or what kinases are driving rejection? Which kinases are potentially driving acceptors? So this is a study that are that you that you've heard from Ali about the um, from Justin Creedon. In this study, we had we investigated disease profiles. So we we studied disease profiles from ten control samples and nine patients biopsy for fibrosis and cirrhosis, and then. We, based off these 10 control samples, we compared the activity levels of the nine fibrosis cirrhosis patients, and we see giant increases or decreases in phosphate or phosphorylation in this family and in this family. And so the mean final score is the change in phosphorylation. It doesn't really mean if there's an increase or decrease, there's just, a, there's just a change in the phosphorylation. And so we're able to quickly see, just based off the scrap, that these are the kinases that are different in our groups, and I need to explore these deeper. So then we're able to blow this up even uh, even wider and see that these kinases in red are the specific kinases that we need to explore that are driving these uh, disease profiles. And this was published in uh, Hepatology with Justin Creed and driving the uh, driving the project. So we have our profiles, we have our acceptors, we have our rejectors, we have the kinases of interest. Now, how can we take this into the clinic? How can we? modulate immune therapy or modulate regimen that modulate modulate medication regimen to influence the clinic. So next step we need to identify therapies that reverse the biomarker profile associated with rejection. So we developed back in 2019, 2020 a reverse signature workflow. And the reverse signature workflow works like this. You have a disease state and then you have a medication uh, signature. And what we look for is the ability to find the disease state discordant signature. So it's the reverse of the signature. So we compare the disease state signature to that of our database I-Links. Uh, this was a database that we worked a lot with with Dr. Meller in Cincinnati. 
and we flip that signature and hopefully you can get the reverse of that. This actually led to an R package that Ali uh, developed called Drug Find R. It's, it's a wonderful package that we're able to use to quickly find drugs with a reverse signature to a disease state that we have. And we actually use this package to find uh, uh, drugs that had reverse signatures to COVID-19. So in this study, we started off with three cell lines. We started off with a cell line that was infected with SARS-CoV-2, a lung biopsy from a patient that had uh, COVID-19, and a bronchial lavage. And the idea of this was to take these three signatures and find drugs that were discordant to them. And in this figure right here, we have our three cell lines, and these are the medic, and then these are the amount of common drugs that are found with discordant signatures to these cell lines. As you can see, somewhat similar to Abdul's figure, that these are the common drugs found between the two cell lines. Now, it would be nice if all three cell lines had drugs that were uh, common between them, but, I, but what we settled on was drugs had to have two common cell lines that were discordant, and then we had um, other filters below that. But at the end of the day, we identified 20 possible medications that could treat SARS-CoV-2. SARS of those 20, five were already in clinical trial. Of those 21 led to a clinical trial being uh, being conducted at the University of Toledo Medical Center. So we were able to we were able to identify one medication that could potentially treat patients. So that's at the transcriptomic level. That's at mRNA. We haven't talked about kinases. Now let's talk a little bit about kinases. So working with uh, Dr. Dr. Wynn, we had two samples from two patients, one with uh, uh, this. So this is from ITSC's frontal cortical neuron, frontal cortical neurons. We homogenized them and we analyzed them on the array. One of the samples was a schizophrenia patient with a four base pair mutation, and then one was their sibling. So this D21 is this individual with schizophrenia, and this C31 is the sibling that does not have schizophrenia. And we can obviously see a clear difference in the signature. So Dr. Wen had this idea, what if we introduced the four base pair mutation in the cell line that did not have schizophrenia? And once we do that, we get a clear similar signature to the patient with schizophrenia. Next, the idea is, what if we rescue the cell line with the four base pair mutation and we get a clear signature that looks like the sibling that does not have schizophrenia? And so this was the idea of the reverse signature. How do we reverse the signature using medications that we have available? So this led to the idea of this plot. So in this plot, we had kinases that were upregulated, downregulated, up and downregulated based off our sample. And we simply went back to the eye links and looked at knockout or overexpression signatures that matched the kinase expression of this plot here. And this led to multiple medications being identified that could possibly help treat uh, schizophrenia. And so this ends the reverse signature. And so where are we today? Where are we currently? So the University of Toledo Medical Center conducts over 300 kidney transplant per year. Of those 300 per year, we have consented over 170 patients. Mark Hoody, one of the medical students, has been part of work while I've been here uh, jumping around the Netherlands. Today, we have 10 patients in pre-op, probably more if Mark's been working hard. We have eight three-week follow-ups, and then our plan is, as soon as we jump back over to the United States, we plan on running kind of, uh, kind of marine ships to start generating some pilot data. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Smith, Dr. Sedwani, Dr. Yudav, Elizabeth Shredroff, uh, who laid down a lot of the groundwork for this project. Mark Hootie, who has been uh, incredibly awesome with consenting patients and making sure that we catch them in pre-op, and the amazing nursing staff and the transplant in pre-op, and uh, the doctors who really help us make sure that we identify these patients. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Hunter. Great. Good story. I have a question. So, so on, come here. So, Show yourself. <laughs> So no, it's up to him. He, he should take the floor, not me. He should answer the question. So in the research you are citing from our own work here at uh, Pemgy, we are very eager to find a relationship between immune therapy and immune status of these patients and 
before they start with immune therapy. Mm -hmm. And what we have found in the literature that there is a relationship between those the status of that patient, mm -hmm. or responder versus the non responders before we start immune therapy, and how his immune activation is starting to react mm -hmm. to that immune therapy in three weeks, six weeks later on. Mm -hmm. So two points to you. The, it's very important for this type of research that you are very strict and when you are seeing those patients back, so you're going to start with this research in October, it's very stringent that you have to be very stringent. How is this patient normally coming back in standard of care? Mm -hmm. And what is that the relationship between the timing, on time, pre-time, pre-treatment in these patients and you're measuring those kinases before treatment and during treatment? I assume, I mean, treatment in your case means a new kidney, mm -hmm. I assume. Yeah. And that's one aspect. And the second aspect here, also which you should take into account, is suppose that there is a relationship because we have looked into T cells, B cells, several populations of the PBMC cell, and we will publish very soon now this year some very exciting validation studies showing the role of those several subsets of cells as well. What do you believe from the transplant? Well, is there is this also because there are several talks now about absorption in here. Do you believe that there is a relationship between uh, kidney transplantation and the immune system, which can be related to the PVC, so is that not what you're looking for? So to, let me just summarize your question. Is there a relationship between PBMC activity and transplant and, and rejection? Is that, did I kind of nail it? Yep. I would say Absolutely. Since when we look at chronic rejection, we're typically looking at an allograft rejection based off the immune system. We're looking to see if the medication that is prescribed is doing its job regulating the immune system. The question is, is, is the medication that we're giving, is the dose that we're giving, is it for that patient? Is it correct for that patient? Can we develop a profile to see if sirolimus is correct, if tacrolimus is, is correct? And so that's the idea there. So, did I answer your question? Yeah, so, have you looked at subsets of subsets as well? Not That's going to be a future direction. Uh, currently, we're simply looking at PBMCs. Uh, I believe I was talking to Dr. Smith either last week, but future directions, once we start applying for my uh, F30 and my R21, we want to start subsetting into monocytes, granulocytes, B cells, T cells, and start looking at the activity of those and the rejector profile and the acceptor profile, and to see if those are the, are the actual individuals driving rejection. Thank you. We'll discuss this first tomorrow. Thank you. Great. Great, guys. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. A little bit later in the program, but uh, we're doing all right. We're doing great. We're we're gonna do. We'll probably do one more talk, uh, Eddie. Yeah, great. Then I'll go very hard. Thank you. If people log okay. off, they log off. But yeah, we still have a That's very okay. fulfilled. Uh, room. We have we have one more relatively short talk. Um, Billy, are you with us? Yes. And this is a remote talk. Uh, William Ryan, also known as Billy, he's currently in, in Toledo. And uh, Billy is a very talented uh, biomimetics PhD candidate. Um, we'll pull him up here on our screen here in the in the room. Jasper gets us sorted out. Uh, Billy's going to talk about integrating RNA seq data uh, with kinomarate data. And this is something we've been working on for a long time. Uh, Billy, we can, I think we can see your screen. You want to advance one slide and prove it to us? In one moment. <laughs> okay. So Great. All right, Billy, the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay. So I, I advanced to the. All right. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you, Rob, for the introduction. Um, as you know, we're living in a post genomic uh, world. You know, this is a mini symposium on kinomics. So it's no surprise that uh, we're going to be talking about integrating uh, kinomic data sets with other omics data sets like transcriptomic data sets or proteomic data sets. Plan for today, uh, we're going to do a brief review of what is omics, why do we care about multi-omics integration, how can we do it, we're going to take a look at a case study of an example of when we did it, and some final thoughts. So first off, uh, what is omics? Uh, omics gives us a comprehensive view of biological systems. We use it to drive health and disease insights, and it enables personalized medicine. Uh, 
So I have a little workflow overview figure on the right here of sort of how omics is used today in systems biology research. So we have different levels of omics like genome, transcriptome, proteome, kinomics, and we use that to predict the effect of a condition or a disease on different biological pathways. And we use that to explain signatures. Uh, and signatures are things like uh, personalized treatments, prognoses and survival scores, or clustering of disease subtypes. So if we take a look at systems biology today, in terms of omics manuscripts, uh, there's about 40,000 omics manuscripts, and this is just a simple search of PubMed for either omics or omics in medicine, but you see uh, over, over the years, uh, exponential increase. Uh, and most of the omics research has been done in about the past 10 years. If we want to take a look at precision medicine uh, and how omics is used in medicine, there's the concept of uh, the disease zone, which is a subset of the genome, uh, and these are disease-involved genes. And then we have the drug ohm, which are targeted disease ohm genes that we use to treat diseases. So this is how we sort of look at omics uh, today used for precision medicine in systems biology research. Just a brief overview again of what omics is. Uh, proteomics is what makes it happening. Uh, metabolomics is what has happened or is happening. And a great addition to this uh, would be a kinase or a kinase uh, part as well. But there's this idea of uh, increasing chemical diversity uh, with these different levels of omics and that ultimately give rise to the phenotype. So taking a look at the interaction between these different levels of omics that I've mentioned, we use uh, these different layers to give uh, a holistic view of cellular processes in a disease state or a, a treatment. Uh, we use them to validate and complement each other, and we use them in integrated studies to give us uh, to reveal complex biological systems. So on the right here is just a little overview of different layers of omics, like proteomics, genomics, uh, metabolomics, and these strategies are used to, in this case, uh, deduce host pathogen interactions in a disease model. So why do we need multi-omics integration? What allows us to integrate these diverse biological data sets that we've been talking about, these omics data sets, and we use that to enhance our disease understanding, leading to things like biomarker development and drug discovery. So see here on the right-hand side is sort of a high-level overview of what uh, multi-omics integration is. We have different levels of omics, we have an integration process, and that leads to downstream analysis, giving rise to deliverables like biomarkers, different disease phenotypes, druggable targets, et cetera. So traditionally with multi-omics integration, uh, traditional tools are things like iCluster, mixed omics, and this is sort of a joint dimensionality reduction technique, sort of a combined PCA where the different levels of omics data are clustered together to identify things like uh, sample clustering that you see on the right side here, uh, different infected pathways. The problem is uh, all these traditional tools today you see here right on the right hand side in panel B, you, know, you have iCluster here, different tools. Uh, none of them account for kinases, specifically kinase activity. So all these multi-omics traditional integration tools uh, are lacking the ability to integrate kinome profiles. More challenges with these traditional multi-omics integration tools. Um, so the technology of omics today is outpacing our ability our research expertise with it. So it's not just uh, transcriptomics anymore. There's proteomics, spatial transcriptomics, many new technologies today. So as our volume of omics data grows, we need new ways to manage it and new tools to integrate it. And without these, uh, we'll be restricted to use omics in research and precision medicine. Another thing is interpretation. Uh, cost the most in omics projects. So our tools that we use, for these traditional tools for multi-omics integration, uh, have challenges when it comes to interpreting uh, the outputs they produce. You see here highlighted uh, the integration issues most commonly are uh, multiple omics data types, 
uh, like I said, most of these traditional tools are lacking the ability to work with kinomics data sets. So how can we do multi-omics integration better? So we've developed a package called Kinograte. Uh, this is a network-based integration method, and it's an open source R software package. It allows us to identify a representative network for a disease state or condition. And the best thing is that it works with kinases. So on the right hand side is the workflow overview figure of kinograde. Starting at, starting in the top, you see different omics uh, levels like RNA, protein, and importantly kinases. And the tool uses external databases like string and enricher and different analytics packages like Ali mentioned earlier, Cursa, UCA, et cetera. Uh, and using that, Kinograde kind of produces a multi-omics integrated network uh, below. So let's talk more about that. How does this work? So the Kinograde kind of method overlays your omics hits. So this would be a kinase hit from running uh, the PAM gene array. This could be a transcriptomic hit from sequencing or a mass spec hit. And it overlays it on a reference protein protein interaction network. And then the method minimizes a function that combines the prizes for, node, for nodes and the costs for the edges between them. So the prizes for each node can be assigned by things like uh, an UCA score, a CURSA score, KA3, PTM, SEA. So these are all outputs from the tools that Ali mentioned earlier. And then the costs uh, for the interactions between them uh, are the string database interaction confidence. So this is text mined and curated protein-protein uh, interactions uh, and their associated confidences. <clears throat> so the process then, uh, if you see on the right-hand side, uh, the initial network is uh, example omics hits overlaid, uh, connected uh, by edge costs. And after it, the multi-omics integration method uh, minimizes this function and runs the method, it produces subnetworks of the most likely representative uh, network, the most representative of the disease or uh, treatment state. So if we take a look at a case study of when we used our uh, multi omics integration method kind of great. Uh, this is a manuscript submitted to neuropsychopharmacology and also it's on bioarchive. And this is developmental pyrethroid exposure, disrupts molecular pathways for circadian rhythms, and synaptic plasticity in mouse brain. So this is a paper where we use RNA and kinome on mouse brain with developmental pesticide exposure. And we did pathway analysis of the multi-omic integration network to make sense of it. We did that for functional uh, interpretation of the multi-omic network. So some top uh, 10 pathways here, uh, protein, serine, threonine, tyrosine kinase activity, uh, regulation of apoptotic process, uh, regulation of program cell death. So these are our top pathway hits from our multi-omics uh, integration analysis. So in terms of what is the answer at the end of uh, our experiment, these would be the top pathways that we'd be interested in looking at. Uh, we can do this with uh, you know, any pathway database. So we can use gene ontology, CAG, reactome. Uh, here for this specific analysis, we use gene ontology pathways. So we want to take a look at finding uh, network hubs. So the uh, which nodes influence our multi-omics uh, integration network the most. And we do that with a hub score. Uh, this is a measure uh, that determines how much influence a node will have over the multi-omics integration network. And you see here on the right, we have the top 10 uh, nodes ranked by their hub score. And the top one you see is AKT1. And the multi-omics integration network, uh, that list of ranked nodes actually includes, you know, this big massive network. Uh, but the problem here is this big massive network is not something we can publish. It's not something you can put in a paper or a grant. So even though we have functionally interpreted our multi-omics integration network, where we have RNA hits and kinase hits and hidden hits, um, how can we present these results? Well, we have something called the multi-omic menu, where we have an in, uh, sort of an interactive web app for multi-omics integration. And it does two things. Uh, it sort of explains the theory and method behind the analysis, 
So a researcher, an investigator, can get an understanding of uh, what went on with their data, and it also presents results to you. But like I said, that big network is not publishable and you can't put in a grant. So how do we visualize our top hits from our analysis? Well, we know AKT1 was a top node by HubScore, and it was also involved in our top pathways. So what we can do is visualize the subnetwork of AKT1 from that very large multiomics network that we analyzed that I showed you earlier. So like I said, AKT was a top ranked network hub and it was involved in our top pathways. So we showed a second degree interaction network for AKT1, which is a sub network of the figure you show. So this shows AKT1 in all nodes uh, connected to it by uh, two nodes away. So that's what second degree means. So for example, AKT1, SOX2, POU, 3F2. So this is the second degree interaction network to visualize our top hit from our analysis. Now, if we didn't have uh, an a priori uh, top hit, such as AKT1, what if we wanted sort of a data-driven uh, interpretation of all of our pathway analyses? Well, we developed a method where we can cluster pathways uh, into different functional groups and assign them uh, names based off their functional uh, classification. So see, you see here on the left-hand side, these are actually uh, all the pathway hits from, from our multiomics uh, analysis. I only showed you the top 10 earlier, but if you want to take a look at all of these, we've done that here where each point is actually a pathway and we've colored it according to its functional cluster that we identified. And this helps interpret uh, the results, the pathway analysis results from your multiomics uh, analyses. You can also see here a uh, similar figure on the right hand side. When said this is a heat map showing the enrichment of each pathway in those functional clusters we identified. So I just want to acknowledge uh, CDRL and the James B. James P. Burkett Lab uh, from that's from the case study we took a look at and uh, the T32 GRISE grant. And I don't know if we have any time left for questions, but if we do, I'll take them. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Cool. Very cool. Any questions? Maybe short, short and sweet. <laughs> we still have a, a large audience, so thank you all for staying with us. Um, I think we kind of just are in the end. All of my slide deck, yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll wrap this up. Yeah, great. Like, great, Rob. Um, I'm, I'm um, <laughs> slide time prepared in case we ran under, but um, that's okay. <laughs> I'm still going to uh, cheat and show a couple of bonus slides mm -hmm. that um, I lost my, I lost my. Uh, there you go. So I'm going to cheat and show a couple of bonus slides. This is just a teaser of some of the Alzheimer's work we're doing. Um, these are postmortem uh, brain uh, homogenous that are pooled in females, and you see a very nice signal of controls and an intermediate signal in mild cognitive impairment, and the, and a real loss of signal in uh, female Alzheimer's disease. We have a couple of big studies we're getting ready to submit for publication focused on this work. I think I lost the clicker again. Help me. Yeah. Uh, but I did promise uh, a couple of bonus slides and um, I'll show this to you now. This is a bonus slide for Eddie. Okay. Eddie requested yeah. this. <laughs> a question that came up in Utrecht about males versus females. And we, we decided, hey, we're publishing our package. We need a test. We need a test cohort. Let's just throw some normal brains on there and see what happens. Just normal brain. And we had three females and three males. And as you can see by the heat map, they're completely different. And we're like, uh oh, because we've been pooling when we did pool studies. We've been pooling our boys and girls. This is a, a published uh, data set. These are all the controls from an Alzheimer's study that was done in collaboration with PamGene, not by us. Another group. Um, this is uh, the the reposited data, just the controls, and you can see how the females, blue, and the males in red. This is unsupervised clustering. You cannot run males and females together. Men and women can all do calculus or spell, but we mm -hmm. do it with different pathways in the brain. And if you pool them, that will be the biggest source of variability in your experiment. In our, in our core facility, we never mix boys and girls samples. We run them as separate groups. So 
Uh, I think there's one last bonus slide. Uh, Sarah Savitra, I don't know if she's still in the room. Savitri. Yeah. She asked about she asked about mitochondrial fractions. I don't have the mitochondrial fraction slide today, but lurking with Lillian Yuan, this work is now published. These are fractions from neurons. We get a really nice, robust signal signature. You know, in all these uh, um, compartments, and as many of you may know, kinases are compartmentalized; they're trafficked. What we're doing with this is we're building um, compartment-specific signatures so we can do deconvolution of a non-fractionated sample to tell you how it's enriched for kinases, which compartment. So I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a bunch of people to thank, but thanks to Pam Jean for letting all of our trainees rant at you today. <laughs> and um, I think we're at it five o'clock. Yeah. So I'll give it back to Ed. Great, great. Thank you, Thanks. So maybe there's some time for questions or a short discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's really cool. There's a lot of applications, so I'm kind of blown away by, by, mm -hmm. by the enthusiasm. So it's really cool. So we'll, we'll do this more often, hopefully. Um, are there some questions from you, Jasper? There's no one online right now with questions, but All they right. are free to raise their hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the digital hands. Yes, and that's good. probably dinner time, but <laughs> people might, might want to go home. So if there's no questions, then I want to thank you all for joining us and probably see you in, in the next time. And then have a, have a great evening. Yeah. Thank you.